to order with getting a roll call. And because I do have a slide up, I may have to get a couple of you to tell me who you are since it only shows me as a plus three. But from NACB, we have Gina Cranwinkle and Jeffrey Gallegos. Present. And John, who is here with us now. Then also from the subcommittee, we have Ashley Reynolds. Nader Present. Thank you. Nader Hashim. Present. And Julio, did I see that you were here? I'm here. Okay, fantastic. And then it looks like we may have two additional people that I can't tell what the um, name is. We have Susanna Davis. Thank you, Susanna. I heard you pop in. Um, and who else? We have um, Julie from the Vermont Control Cannabis Commission. Yeah, I got that. It looks like there's another person, and maybe I'm just seeing I, things. Danica, I think I'm in there twice, once as the camera yes. and once to record. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much I appreciate that um, okay very good so in coming to order um, this is just our normal reminder that we do each week of what our milestones are and Friday is October 1st so that everyone is aware and that is our first milestone date for putting a plan together for reducing or eliminating fees for social equity applicants with our next big milestone coming October 15th um, and then, of course, November uh, in November 2021, there is um, the the um, desire to have a larger scale meeting on uh, with the subcommittee and the advisory committee and stakeholders for social equity. So, with that being said, I would like to um, note that we do not have any um, electronic uh, comments that were. Um, submitted this week, but to remind everyone, and I'll replace this deck because it appears I picked up an old one, that um, if you would like to make public comments, you may do so at ccb.vermont.gov through the public input form, but we do not have any today. And then I would like to move to um, approval of Thursday, September 23rd, uh, Social Equity Subcommittee meeting minutes. May I get a motion to approve? Motion to approve. And a second? I'll second. Thank you so much. Excellent. So today's big agenda item, um, fees. And so Gina, if you'd like to tell me where you'd like to be directed or if you'd like to start here, that works just fine. And you, so we get to start where we left off with such a really heated conversation we were having on this. And obviously this is one of our, you know, one of our most important topics that we're gonna be speaking about. So I really wanna take this time right now to really go over. Where we sort of left it off is um, the application fee should be waived for social equity. Um, and then we went with recommendation one, which is the first year the license should be waived. The second year we should have 25% of the fee. Third year, 50% of the fee. Fourth year, 75% of the fee fifth year um, full price. We also recommended a waiver possibility um, for the first and second year if you were able to demonstrate financial need, but also had a plan to remedy this situation going forward. So what is your business plan to increase revenue and profitability? We also have gotten, um, so it doesn't mean it will be completely waived, but partial or full waiver can occur during those years. And then we got into a lovely conversation about should we have caps on how much a social equity licensee should make revenue wise. Um, if they hit a certain cap, should then they be mandated to pay uh, for their um, annual license. And so I'm going to just hand this over to Ashley, who started us out in that conversation. Um, and then afterwards, we'll get into discussing about how many licenses a social equity candidate can apply for. So, Ashley? I appreciate that. Thanks, Gina. Um, yeah, I did mention kind of trying to put in some kind of safeguard for abusing the program. And I think after taking the weekend to kind of think about it and thinking about, you know, capping revenue um, versus limiting integrated licenses. Um, I like the route of limiting the integrated licenses, meaning that somebody can't get a license at every 
sector of the supply chain that is all going towards the dispensary, potentially retail sales um, of the same entity. So I think that's the smartest way to not um, put all the, the earnability into you know only a handful of people's hands. Um, I also, this just came out of the compliance enforcement and talking about sort of what other safeguards there are, like would they have to pay back the fees if they could afford them kind of thing retroactively after those five years. So we can get into that. But one safeguard that Massachusetts does is that if there is a request um, for limited or for um, percentages off, of licensing annual fees. For instance, if somebody sells only 85% um, of their inventory over six months, then there would be someone to come in and say, okay, well, why aren't you selling 100% of it? You see what I'm saying? And then if they aren't able to sell you know, upwards of 85% of their um, grown or acquired material for retail, that they would be dropped down in here for how much they could grow or how much they could sell. Um, so I thought that that was actually a really sensible way of going about things from Massachusetts. And, um, I wonder if we could have perhaps Jennifer in one of our meetings sometimes to talk about sort of their social equity program, which I'm pretty sure is her, that's the committee she heads or the um, commission she heads. Um, yeah, so I'm familiar with Massachusetts. So the 85% that they do is a good point. They do that for all of their licensees. So it's not just for social equity um, and can be something that, you know, Vermont considers, you know, if you're not um, being utilizing your full license, you know, should you go down a tier in licensing, um, especially for a cultivator um, standpoint. And we do make lots of notations of the Massachusetts models. I know we've done it with um, the recommendation for fee and application waivers. And then we are also going to talk about the benefits that they have. And if the attachments that have been sent to you via email and what is at the end of this PowerPoint presentation link shows a comparison of what exactly Massachusetts is doing, um, just to get into more details as well. Um, but yes, they have a really great program out there and those are definitely things that we consider on this phone call right now. Um, I really like about the suggestion instead of limiting revenue, because we want the, uh, people to have the ability to succeed and tapping that could result in them not working as hard, um, but perhaps limiting the amount of licenses that a social equity is able to apply for under um, a social equity program. So right now, I mean, I would love to hear, Julio, what is your opinion about this? And what I'm thinking is just one license per person and then going over the possible licenses that we have available um, to make sure that we're okay with each of those licenses. I guess my question is whether you mean one license per step in, in the, the chain of production through retail or whether you mean um, that a, a social equity license can only um, apply to one run uh, on the chain of distribution. I wasn't sure what you were referring to. So I was referring to that they are allowed to pick one chain, so one license reduction per social equity candidate per any stage in um, distribution. So if you want to, you can have a reduction in cultivation and that you choose one of those tiers of cultivation, but you can get a dispensary and a cultivation license. So could they are they eligible to get those licenses on a non-social equity basis? Like yeah. they have to compete with other folks, is that the idea? That's the idea. 
So what we're trying to do is not to um, infuse the market um, with just because they feel that you know we have the application fee and there's no fee for us for the first year of trying to get all of the licenses um, and seeing where their best fit may be. You know, really for them to choose the concentration um, that they would like to follow. But this is an open conversation, so I'd love to hear your opinion. You know, you can say yeah or nay to that. Well, I'm trying to get more information so I can I feel a little more confident on, on what what direction I want to take. I, I haven't yet heard anyone really identify even the ballpark as to what the size of the fees that the state would be waiving um, or um, for, for any given year. And so it's hard, it's hard to really judge how much the state is giving up or, or how much of an advantage it is to other non-social equity, I mean, the social equity actors compared to their competitors. Do we have any idea yet what, what that amount is? It's hard, I mean, because I think when you're talking about whether you're giving someone, quote, too much, I don't really ha have any real sense of how much is uh, a full license fee for any of the years. I'm going to just see if I, if I have, um, I do have, and I'm going to see how we can kind of show this. Nika, I'm going to email this to you. And this has not been voted on, so this um, is really just proposed um, fees that have uh, been sent um, that Tanika, once she has it, is received. So this is just the conversation that we're having today. It's not to say that we need to limit the amount of licenses that a social equity candidate can have. Uh, we're just seeing, you know, having a conversation is that something that we want to do um for vermont i see jeffrey you have your hand up and Danica, if you can just check your email i forward you those please yes thanks Gina. um there's a, there you a couple of things have come up so first of all um according to so this is in act 164 in section 909b uh, my understanding is that integrated licenses will already be limited to people that hold a dispensary registration on April 1st, 2022, there should be no more than five total integrated licenses, one for each registered dispensary. So it sounds like there's already a structure in place based on my reading of this part of the Act 164. Um, so maybe that, maybe we don't need to go too far into how to limit integrated licenses because they already are. Um, and then as far as um, the fees go, I think you said Danica's gonna post that one coming from the market structure subcommittee of where they're at as far as the amount. Is that what you said, Gina? Okay, um, and also, I think just overall to look at at um, the social equity program, the reason why the fees are being waived is because the, du the dues have already been paid by the social equity applicant. And to not look at this like the state is giving a, a freebie to, to the social equity applicants, the social equity applicant has already kind of paid their application fee by the disproportionate impact of cannabis prohibition. So just maybe, to remember that that's where we're coming from. It's not just like a, a, a handout. No, I, I didn't mean it to be taken that way. I'm really talking about when you waive a fee, it's an opportunity cost to the state of Vermont. It would be money that the state of Vermont would realize that could be used for other aspects of the program. Uh, I just don't even, I haven't heard, and I've only been, I'm late to this game, uh, to this, this enterprise, so I, I haven't heard any uh, I, I just don't even have a sense of the scale, like what Massachusetts fees are, and I don't even know if that's even a, a, a comparator to Vermont. But um, because I because I don't know how much of a um, you know how much is being waived, it's hard for me to say that um, continuing the waiver. Uh, through you know 50% or 75% of what I don't I just don't really know and I don't know how that impacts the social equity applicants who are trying to start and I don't know how it, how it implicates funding that would be otherwise available for other aspects of the program so it's just it's hard for me it's hard for me to to get my hands around that without even having 
even uh, you know just a rough ballpark of what we're talking about in terms of uh, fees for for those years. Uh, so uh, we, have, we have just gotten those. So one of the issues that we've been having is that we are creating the market as we're creating the social equity program. So this is you know something new to us. And just please bear with us because these numbers can change at any time. So these are just a rough estimate now. Um, Can I know that this is what they are talking about in the other market. Point of clarification about the integrated licenses. So the integrated license type itself is limited, but licensees could essentially vertic vertically integrate. Like they could be a retailer and a producer or something. So that is just a point of clarification for this conversation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Nader, you have a question? Uh, I, I did accidentally raise my hand, but um, I, I do have a thought on my mind um, that I was just thinking of. You know, if we're, could we potentially see any problems if we're, you know, if we have some licenses that are much more expensive than other licenses? And for example, I'm looking at the tier one license, $10,000 compared to the tier one outdoor cultivation license, which is $500. And I know that these can change, but could there potentially be issues if people are planning ahead and they're thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to try the social equity license for the most expensive one, and then there'll be a flood of candidates for that license, and then there'll be more competition for these other licenses? I mean, I again, I'm not a business person, but I'm just wondering what potential issues there could be, if any, if there's any thoughts on that. Great question. Think, that's why we're having this discussion right now, Ashley. I think that's a, a, a really, really good point, and that's where my mind goes as well. Like, I want there to be as little barriers for a social equity applicant to get set up and be successful. But, okay, we flood the market because a social equity applicant applies for the largest grow indoor cultivation then all of that flower has to be sold somewhere and then what so then another social equity applicant has had you know there's all the fees have been waived for them to have their dispensary like we're looking at these fees and this is a lot of money this is a ton of money and yes this is definitely an aspect of a barrier for any applicant social social equity or not but it's all expensive um it's all expensive and so i think we are relatively in agreement that we just don't want to see abuse happen at every aspect of the supply chain. But I think you hit the nail on the head, Nader, that that's 100% what, what could happen potentially. And can we just go back really quickly so it's really crystal clear that there can be vertical integration for an entity that has, so they have a dispensary, they have a grow, they have a processing license, and they have, what's the other one? Am I in the thing? Um, so one can, can be vertically integrated, or we're saying we are limiting the integrated license to prevent vertical integration for one entity. Can you just clarify that? I just, my mind is making its clarifications, but I want to make sure it's crystal clear for everyone. Yeah, and Julie, if you can just clarify, I believe that she did say you couldn't get an integrated license, that that's for the medicinal cannabis dispensaries now, but um, you would be able to get licenses in the different areas. Is that is that correct, Julie? Yes, yeah, so the integrated license as a license type is limited, but you could stack, if you will, is maybe a better term, right? You could stack a retailer with a a manufacturer with a you know with a grow operation you could stack your licenses is maybe the better way to use it when it's individual license types and I see how that is making sense for the medical program but we, are we assuming that the medical dispensaries are all going to become rec dispensaries and that then that will already be in place for them or no we're unsure if they're going to have integrated licenses, actually. Okay. Okay. Thank you. It's all of them. But right now they are uh, vertically integrated. Okay. 
Uh, so I think we should take a look at this. So from outdoor cultivation, they have at, um, up to 1,000 square feet at 500, 3,000 square feet for 2,000, on um, tier three, which is 6,000 square feet at 4,000. And then tier four, which is up to 10,000 square feet, that is a delayed one. So it would not be available at the start. Ashley, you still have your hand up? Do you have a comment? Okay. Um, and then we have uh, tier one indoor cultivation, the same thing. So we have at 1,000 square feet at 2,000, um, tier two at 2,500 square feet, 8,000. Tier three, which is 5,000 square feet at 12,000. Tier four is 10,000 square feet at 20,000. Tier five is 25,000 square feet and at, that would be at 50,000. Then tier six is also delayed. So that will not be available unless the market demands it, which would be up to 50,000 square feet at 75,000. So that is not a license. Jeffrey, I see your hand. Yes, thanks. I just wanted to clarify to this group also that um, the market structure subcommittee two proposals. So this fee proposal A is only one of them and kind of the more higher priced one. Fee proposal B has a has the same kind of structure but our lower price lower fee. Yes. Yeah, so, um. Julio, you, um, Jeffrey, thank you for that. I think this is the one they sent to me, so I think this might be the one that they're leaning towards, but I'm not sure. As I said, these prices are subject to change. Um, it's a little hard, I know, to make decisions when we're making other decisions that impact our decisions, uh, but this does definitely give people a rough idea of what it would look like. Um, Julio, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think these numbers, you know, even if these are ballpark numbers, I think really help me. I don't, I don't share the concern that um, about waiving fees according to that schedule you previously put up based on a, um, a social equity applicant becoming, you know, extraordinarily successful. Um, you know, 50% waiver of, uh, you know, that, that amounts to ten thousand dollars and then wage state fees I don't think is particularly impactful unless there's a projection that there are going to be you know hun many hundreds or thousands of these licenses at that amount for social equity applic applicants I don't know that there is any kind of I don't think there's any cap or I don't know if there's any projection or, or estimate as to how many people would be seeking these licenses and that's I think that those concerns for me are particularly, uh, or I don't know how to put this, I, I have to put this, uh, I guess, in the opposite way. I have even less concern about the waivers for the retailer or manufacturing. I think those are almost, by comparison, inconsequential compared to the large cultivation um, license uh, fee. Mm. Um, thank you, Julio. Um, for your opinion so far on the so yes, the retail licenses are significantly less. So we have um, retail that goes anywhere from five. Um, it'll be 5,000 for a storefront, 2,000 if you're cloning, and then they have conditional on regulation. So it's, um, limited is 1,000, farmer 500. Um, manufacturing license is tier one is 10,000, tier two is 2,500. So. Um, the difference is solvent extraction that a tier one can do that a tier two cannot, which significantly limits them. Um, then we have integrated, which is the 50,000, which we're not worried about. And then in the wholesale and testing laboratories is a 1,000 each so far. This is the proposal B right now, which seems to have similar pricing as the first one. Ashley, I see your hand raised. Um, I just want to kind of touch on, you know, we haven't gotten as far as like how many social equity applicant licenses are there going to be? Are we going to limit licenses at all in Vermont? To put it in perspective, so Massachusetts has like quite a robust um, demand for cannabis and um, I would say, you know, 
Um, yeah. <laughs> and just in that state, there's a hundred dispensaries for that huge state. And Boston and all that. Like Vermont doesn't have that. Um, so I, you know, I do hear what Julio is saying. Uh, that there's not going to be hundreds of thousands of people coming to Vermont that are seeking this type of license. But I, now that there's no residency requirement, I mean, why, why wouldn't someone who sees an opportunity to take advantage of, you know, an opportunity? I mean, this is incredible for anybody to be on the journey of owning a cannabis company on this wild ride. And I feel that, um, we just really got to make sure. I, I'm, I don't want to limit things um, to a, a, a level that doesn't allow for a level playing ground, but I really think we should think long and hard to be sure that we don't just have, you know, hundreds of people coming from other states. Yes, they may be social equity applicants under what we had just determined is the definition, but I don't want to see that we just get flooded. Like there, there's a huge potential for flooding the market in all aspects of the supply chain, in all aspects of um, applicants. And so that has happened in plenty of other legal cannabis states. And I really, we're so tiny that the ability to flood is so small. And we saw this already happen in the hemp industry that like it, there was a huge bust or a huge boom and then a bust. And I really just, want to try to prevent that on all levels, regardless of the applicant status. Gina, I can't Lisa? raise, I can't raise my hand because I'm showing screen. So just, just to put perspective for you, one thing to, to leave, there's 6.7 million people in the state of Massachusetts to a hundred licenses. Did she clarify? Cause I was on that call, whether, what kind of lessons those were? Those were just dispensaries. Just dispensary. So 6.7 million people, 100 licenses, 660 in Vermont, 660,000 population. Um, Something to, to that, that I just wanted to put those, those stats out there just to to talk about the disparity in just sheer population. Yes, yeah, that's um, a really good point. Right now, the market structure committee is having at this moment in time, unlimited licenses. Now, if that changed, then I could understand us changing how many licenses we give out. Um, but we're just trying to coincide with what they're doing. I saw Susanna's hand, and then um, Nadar saw your hand after that. So, Susanna? Love. Yeah, thank you. I, I would be inclined to agree with Julio. I think that we're talking about a matter of scale. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, how much are we, how much are we conceivably going to save as a state versus a state with a surplus that has performed economically exceptionally well in the last, you know, 18 months, as opposed to what benefit could this provide for small scale people looking to get into the industry. Um, and I also think that it's really important that we keep in mind that when we talk about limiting the number of something in order to prevent flooding or, or too much entry, then we're doing two things. One, we're prioritizing commerce over everyone else or everything else. But the second thing, which I think is, is really common and, and we need to watch out for, is taking an approach where the limitations we want to impose are always on marginalized people. Instead of saying, if we have to impose some sort of limitation for the health of the market, Let's impose it on people who historically had unmitigated privilege and access, right? But instead, taking the approach that would put limitations on people who have already been historically harmed, I think only perpetuates the mindset of, you know, that it's somehow like charity that we can take, give it and take it away, and that the limitation always has to be from the people from whom justice has been withheld. I hope that that made sense. It did. Thank you so much for those thoughts, Susanna. I think it really helped for this conversation. And Nader? Thank you. Um, I had one thought, maybe a possible solution, but instead of looking at uh, waiving the fees for just one license type, why don't, is it possible we could look at waiving a certain 
amount of money for either one or multiple licenses. And so, um, and I'm just making this number up just for this example, but you know, if we were to say hypothetically we'll waive five thousand uh, dollars, that person could then pick the retail storefront license along with the tier two cultivation license, or they could choose to just go for the tier three cultivation license. Um, and of course, we, there's you know we can pick any number, but um, could that be a potential solution to what we're discussing? Definitely neither, and I think it's something we should we should discuss right now. One thing that I would like to just give people perspective of is that you know we're trying to help a social equity candidate who has had harm done. This is what our remedy is to it. We're also dealing with people who have been significantly underprivileged, whether that was time in custody where they weren't able to work. Um, or whether that be low social economic background. Now, if our point is to try to help them to advance, um, we need to make the bar of entry as low as possible and be able to support them throughout the chain. Another thing is, is that we are trying to ensure that people will be able to survive in the industry with the training and resources that we provide them with in hopes that they will have thriving businesses and that their money will then go back into taxes, which helps to rebuild Vermont. It is a cycle. Even if we have people who come from other states um, to join Vermont, they will be adding to the Vermont economy by housing, uh, by purchasing things there by helping to stimulate the lower economy. So yes, in some senses, we sort of see the monetary value, oh, well, we're giving a waiver that costs X amount of dollars. But we are hoping that this creates stability in those people's lives, um, makes them be able to rise from where they currently stand, and help the overall economy in a cycle. So just you know, just give that perspective, um, which is why we have a five-year tier level here, which we're hoping that in the five years, they will be able to be fully functional on their own um, and to be sustainable. Um, so just to, to give an overall perspective of this picture, because sometimes it's very hard to see that um, when we're doing slides. Um, one of the things that I think we should talk about is, you know, everyone's thoughts on do we limit the amount of licenses? Do we limit the amount of fee coverage? Um, or n nothing at all, just leave it as you can apply as a social equity licensee. Um, just going from my screen, I have Julio and then Ashley and Nader. Uh, Julio, your thoughts? Well, I don't know. I, 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 I think if the market overall is going to be limited, um, I think that is enough of, I mean, I think that's enough of a kind of commercial curb on there being market glots where the price is so low, there's overproduction. Um, that, and so that no one can really be pro profitable in the short run. You have a lot of people exiting the market. Uh, I don't have concerns about um, uh, ad adding a, a separate li limit for social equity applicants if people otherwise meet the social equity criteria and they're given a license after we know that they're bona fide and they've got, you know, essentially a story to tell. And I'm also not concerned if you know, as the market takes shape in four or five years, if it turns out that the market is dominated by social equity applicants by virtue of having reduced fees for them to take off, um, that doesn't trouble me a bit. Um, I, if uh, you know, part of the state of vision for the, the model um, in the legislation is to provide, you know, opportunities for those parts of, uh, you know, the, that those parts of our economy where people have been underserved or 
um, su suffered more direct harms. Uh, you know, if there's going to be um, success, though, if those folks have the opportunity to, to succeed and they are succeeding, then their success is going to pay back the state in terms of tax revenue. I'm looking, you know, much further down the, the road than the first, you know, three or four years. So, um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with the, the, the fee reduction that we previously saw on the slide. Uh, I don't think we're, quote, giving too much uh, to potentially wildly successful social equity applicants. I hope we, we do find that um, there, are, there are lots of them that are very successful. And, and I, don't, I don't think we need to limit the number of licenses if people otherwise meet the criteria that are set up to, to get such a license. Thank you. Thank sure. you so much. So we have to leave it the way that it is and allow for a social equity um, candidate to decide. Ashley, your thoughts? Oh, um, I'm not. I'm not ready yet. I'm, I want to keep listening. Um, Nader, your thoughts? Um, I mean, there's. This is an understatement, but there's a lot to consider um, that I'm still kind of marinating it at the moment. But I'm just, I mean, my, my thoughts are as they were 10 minutes ago. Um, you know, I'm still thinking about the idea of people, social equity candidates, feeling compelled to pick a certain license because that license fee will be waived when in their minds they would prefer pursuing a different license because it more so fits their skills or what they desire to do. Uh, so that's mostly what I'm thinking about at the moment. And uh, if I, if anything else pops up, I'll chime in. Thank you. Um, Tanika, can we go back to the PowerPoint presentation? I would like to table this until next week about the fee. I want you, I'm, I'm not next week, on Thursday, sorry. Um, to really sort of have the time um, to really think this over. One thing that I do really want to say is that everything that we're speaking about right now are hypothetical. You know, um, we are estimating the worst and we're always sort of hoping for the best. And so we would, you know, we have to rely on the person and have really have trust that a social equity candidate sees this up as an opportunity and that they also want to be able to thrive and be successful, and that they would choose the license or licenses, um, in this case, um, that would best fit them um, and with the support and help by this program. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, we may need to get to a more balanced realization and have trust um, in these candidates. Jeffrey? Sorry, one last thought before it goes all the way on the table is that uh, something I just thought of is limiting, maybe limiting every applicant in the state to a pool of license would encourage collaboration. I don't know if you want to go that oh, deep. What, what was that license, Jeffrey? No, I mean like any, any applicant, whether they're social equity or not, limited to a single license and then it's kind of, it kind of compels people to collaborate with each other. Um, but that's maybe not, not the right concept. I don't know. Just stop throwing it out there. Yeah, unfortunately, that's not our decision to make. Uh, but that is a very good opinion, Jeffrey. I mean, it does allow us to work as a unit. So we're going to table this, give it lots of thoughts, email me if you have any questions, comments. Um, I, this is a really tough decision. This is not an easy one. And so we're table it for now. But I want to go into more about it, that there's other fees that we need to consider. Um, they wanted to have a provisional license application fee of $500. So basically, it's if you were going to apply for a license, you pay $500 up front. It gives you an opportunity to start to look for space. Um, and then if you were fully going to commit, then you can apply for a full license. I was making a recommendation that that was waived. Uh, employee registration fee, which is a registration card fee that is required by the state of Vermont 
to be paid by businesses, and then there were local fees of $100, which, you know, do we want the social equity candidate to pay or not? I'm just giving you an overview of that to think about that when you're thinking about the other ways um, fees. And everybody should have copies of this. One of the things that I think will help you um, when you're thinking about fees is a social equity licensee business. So I really want to state that a licensed business is, so if you're a candidate, you can apply for a license. This is, a business owner should be at least 51% should be owned by a social equity candidate. Um, the social equity candidate must be involved with the daily operations and be able to make decisions for the business. Um, and the social equity candidate must meet state requirements to open a business. I think that this is really important. We want to guarantee that the social equity, that this business is for the social equity candidate and it's not being run or in charge um, by someone else. Um, what is everybody's thoughts around that? Ashley? Um, it seems really hard to like use this word when we're talking about a social equity candidate, but like how, how would you determine that? How would you determine if somebody Yes, and 51%, you can put that in your um, your business proposal. Yes, you can do that for your taxes. But like, to say like social equity candidate must be involved with daily operations to be able to make decisions for the business, like how on earth would you determine that? So the reason for this prohibition is to make sure that someone is not opening up a company for someone else and just using that they're a social equity licensee. So we would want to see what is your time schedule? You know, what is your salary? You know, um, on your partnership agreement, what is the percentage of the company that is owed to you? Um, you know, what if there is a voting system on making decisions, how much percentage does that person have? So that is really important and it's just to ensure that that person that we now have a business by a social equity candidate and not someone who's opened up for someone else just to be able to get the reduction in fees. And I think what would also be really helpful like we're just looking at these fees and yes that's a part of it but um, I wonder if there's a way um, and maybe we can reference Jennifer on this one, but I wonder if there's a way for us to understand like the full scope, like surveillance, you know, um, uh, all the security systems to protect the folks that are working in the facility, um, you know, health inspections. Um, I mean, there, there's so many other fees and I think that perhaps we might not really be fully understanding what all the startup fees are and what all the fees, not even fees, but just the cost that is to have a campus dispensary. I mean, that seems like what we want to talk about the most as far as like where the most money can be made. Um, but I think it'd be really helpful. And I can try to bring that to the meeting on Thursday just to really, it, I mean, it's all expensive. We understand that, but like really get to know these fees I think it may um, make it easier for us to agree on that tier one for waiving fees. Yeah, so right now we will, we're focusing on that application fee and the licensing fee, and then we will talk about uh, specialty licenses hopefully on Thursday and benefits that people will receive. Um, and also we're gonna talk about you know, people participating in the social equity program that is not just a licensee holder because we want to ensure a very, you know, inclusive industry. And that means getting social equity candidates at different levels of the industry as well and being able to get the educational resources that this program will provide. Um, we are starting right now to see, you know, what is that licensing. But this is another thing that we're taking into account. 
we will not be helping with the operational business day-to-day -day things. You know, the development fund um, is addressed in that way. Um, we will discuss about a co-op licensing soon to really start to say, you know what the most expensive thing is, is land and equipment. And here's a license, um, how we can have people work together in order to reduce that burden. But this is minor in the major scale of things, you know. So I think that social equity candidates do realize that. And so they're saying, yes, we're getting, you know, the application waived, the license fee waived. But we know that it's very, very expensive to play in the cannabis industry. Um, and, you know, we can only do as much as we can um, because there is a very limited budget. There's only 500000 in the um, cannabis development program. So it would not, even if we divided it, it would be a very low, low amount for everybody. And so, so these are things to consider as I think a social equity candidate will consider um, when doing it. And also why we don't want to limit education to just, a, or this program to just a licensee because that may not be the best route for everyone to go down. Um, and we will be, once we get past this, as this is our first deadline that we need to have, we can start getting into the benefits um, and educational programs that we would like for a social equity program. Nader, your thoughts? I mean, I, I agree with these points here. Um, you know, I'd like to avoid seeing social equity applicants be tokenized for their, uh, for having access to these licenses and then, you know, just being manipulated. Um, so I, I think these are good provisions to have and I think, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I think these are good provisions to have. Thank you. And Julio? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree with Sander and the proposal here. Um, to me, it, it very much resembles the process that is, um, that, you know, is implemented by disadvantaged business enterprises who might receive financial assistance from federal government contracts like the Agency of Transportation where there are rules and procedures for if there are questions about whether there's been a change in ownership, there's a there's an obligation for the business to self-report uh, if you know if if the change in ownership uh, makes it less than 51 percent owned uh, for for there to be if there are people who believe you know who can make a complaint and say they're not following these criteria for that to be followed up on or for the board or whoever administers decertification of licensees that they on their own based on information that they receive um you know can uh investigate and take proceedings to decertify someone as an sbe licensee versus a regular licensee and then for their i would assume there would be some uh you know some process involved for that for the the uh, the enterprise to, to be heard and to answer to those those concerns. I mean that's just kind of basic policing for and enforcement for any sort of license. And so this doesn't. I mean these criteria here I think are, are sensible and I think there's there's precedent for it in other government programs that op that operate every day in this country. Thank you for your comment. And Ashley, are you in agreement with? this criteria here? I am. Can we just state for the record that um, we have a consensus that this is criteria that we would like to keep as part of the social equity program? And then I would like to go to public comment. Julie? Yep. We have two. If you can just type in the chat box anyone who has a public, uh, the name oh, of sure. anyone who shares public comment. Yep. Please. So I think we have two public comments. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, is this the camera? Yes. Go ahead. Hi, it's Dave Silverman um, from Middlebury. I'm an attorney. I uh, work with a lot of folks in this industry or want to be in this industry. 
Um, I, I want to respond to uh, Nader's uh, uh, question, comment earlier that, um, you know, concern that, that fee waivers in some license type versus others might um, create a, a perverse incentive to have people go into one, you know, in, into a, an imperfect business type for them. I, I really don't see that as a thing. I think as Gina um, mentioned, there's so many other costs that are, are going to be involved and are, are, that the control board is not going to be able to do anything about for folks that, uh, you know, $1,000, $5,000, um, you know, even $10,000 for an extraction license, which is a very, um, you know, high license fee in comparison to the others. But when you think about what it takes to stand up a CO2 extraction facility, you know, it's, it's multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars of just of equipment costs. Um, and so, you know, the, the waiver, whether or not it's there, I don't think that's going to move the needle for folks. Um, I, I think folks are going to go into a business uh, that they can afford to go into uh, and that they have the skills and, and, and the ability to be profitable in, uh, regardless of the fee waiver, which is really nice. Uh, you know, I don't want to you know, discourage fee waivers in any, in any way. I think it's, it's a great benefit. Um, but I think where you're going to be able to really help folks access those business types, you know, access profitability in, in all these business types is through some of the other areas that the control board has uh, authority or direction in the social equity sphere, uh, particularly uh, the area where Director Davis and the Department of Labor and Agency of Commerce Community Development and Department of Corrections are supposed to get together and create uh, a, a programming, uh, a, a technical assistance programs uh, for, for social equity applicants in, in these businesses, both in licensed businesses and uh, ancillary businesses, and I think that's really a powerful tool uh, that the board will get to use later down, uh, you know, down the road. It's going to need some budget allocation uh, to be successful. But um, I just want to kind of, you know, point that out. Make sure that your eyes on that ball as well because it's a very important one. Um, so thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, Ben Mervis spoke with you last week. Thank you again for the time. Um, not that he needs it, but I'd like to second everything that Dave Silverman just said because uh, very valuable insight. And then I also wanted to just highlight a few things that I've heard from you all today that I think were excellent, including uh, from Director Davis, specifically specifically uh, not limiting from those who from whom justice has been withheld. Um, as I mentioned last week, I'm working with a close friend and colleague, Craig Mitchell. He does fit the qualifications for a social equity applicant. Um, and he's someone who, as soon as the conversation around cannabis in Vermont picked up, he said, I'd love to be a part of this. He just didn't know where to start. And luckily, he has a friend who's been in the industry. Um, so I, I do now have his permission to share. He does have a family member who's currently serving, hopefully, the last year of his sentence with a cannabis-related crime. Um, and going through that is going to be a huge burden on his family. Um, it's gonna be a huge burden for himself, as it has been for many years. And so he will, of course, be involved with the business, but with the day-to-day -day decision making, um, I just want to uh, suggest or encourage you, again, to look into the idea of cohorts and hearing directly from people like Craig and other people with these lived experiences to really better define things like daily involvement, because it's something that we, as a business team, are talking about every day, trying to define roles and responsibilities within the business. It's something that, even though I've worked with many social equity applicants before, um, I, I learn from him every day, and I'm grateful both as a friend and a colleague to have those experiences, to hear about them, um, to understand them better, and to work them into our business plans. Uh, and the last part I just want to highlight is, um, Julio, thank you so much for what you said, because I think it, it's a dream to imagine a successful market filled with social equity applicants. It's something when we look at what's happening in the rest of the country, um, and we see the way that social equity applicants are, continue to be marginalized or pushed to the side. The idea of a Vermont market that is um, full of color and diversity and lived experiences is um, a nice dream, and I, I hope to see it come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Thank you. I think that's it for public comment today, Gina. Thank you. Do we have any final comments or questions? Um.
Okay. Um, well then, can I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? I'll make that motion. Second. Thank you. And I will see you all on Thursday. Have great days. Thank you all.